All right. Thank you very much for attending or watching later on Worldwide Slot Car Chat number 27. I'm your host, Greg Gaub. We've got most of our regulars today. We got John Kitt, uh, Luff Linkert, uh, Graham. We've also got Chris Walker on the line and a couple of new uh, attendees. Uh, and I do have a couple of topic suggestions uh, sent to me prior to the meeting, so we'll, we'll cover those. Uh, before we get to those topics, does anybody have anything that they want to bring up? Any show and tell, news tidbits, or anything that they want to throw on the floor? Go for it, Graham. Oh, Graham, I just wanted to say thanks for the people last week that uh, showed off their tracks. It was just gorgeous. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, and Kelly oh. couldn't be here, but he started the chat and I was talking to him for a minute. He said that that was, that was awesome, looking back through that video and, and looking at everybody's tracks. And it inspired him to go ahead and get his table set up so that he would have a track to play on and maybe show us later. Hey, I Phil. Went Russell's, I went on to Russell's Facebook site after and took a deeper look into his track setup. Yeah, it's nice to be able to see the actual pictures rather than low resolution through Zoom or whatever. That was great. Yeah, he's, he's got a nice, well done page with lots and lots of pictures and things that he shares. So if you're, if you uh, haven't seen it, you know, by all means, look up, uh, what was the name of his page? Like uh, Slot Cars with a Z or something like that. We'll look that up later. Uh, but yeah, great to see his track. So uh, without anybody saying me, 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 I want to ask a question. I'll, I'll go into our topics. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to go off on a little bit of a rant. Because one of the topics that we'll get to later was brought to me by somebody seeking assistance with their slot car setup. Uh, they're racing with a club and they're, you know, they're new. And so they're learning the basics of how to set up cars according to the club specifications. And of course, wanting to get the best performance. You know, they, they, they understand that they still got to work on their driving skills, but want to at least have a car relatively competitive with the rest of the people in the club. And most of the people in the club are not forthcoming with assistance. Uh, or if the assistance has been given, then they kind of, you know, drift off on their willingness to provide assistance. So this person came to me and said, you know, hey, Greg, can you help me with this stuff? Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of uh, help for him with those specific things, which we'll get to later, mostly, you know, gear setup and, and offsets and pods and motors and stuff like that. I usually just go stock. So hopefully get some input from you guys from there. But I wanted to lambast people who are like that. First of all, if you want your club to survive, you need new members. Most of your members are probably old white guys like me and they're gonna die. We're gonna die, you're gonna die, your club will die if you don't have new members. Sorry, that's the way it is. If you want new members, you have to be welcoming to new members. You have to be helpful to new members because if you're a jerk, they're not gonna come back. They're gonna either get out of the hobby entirely or they're gonna go find somebody else to race with your club will die. So you have to be welcoming. You have to be helpful. You have to remember you were not born a slot car expert. You did not arrive in this world knowing everything you know about slot cars. So whatever kind of slot cars you race with, whether it's HO, Scale Electrics, 124, wing cars, whatever you race with, you weren't born with that information. Maybe you can say that you did all your research and didn't have to get it from any specific person, but you know what? Somebody wrote the pages that you're reading. Somebody gave you that information. And honestly, I'm just going to say it. You're a jerk if you don't help and share your information. And there are jerks in the world. And it's unfortunate when a club is primarily made up of jerks who don't want to share. Uh, so... <laughs> If you're the person looking for assistance, join this chat and ask for assistance. Message anybody that's in this chat for assistance. And if they don't know how to help you specifically, we'll bring it up in chat. We'll go online. We'll do whatever we can to help. Hopefully, there's at least one or two 
members of your club who, who know what they're doing and are, are open to providing assistance and not being condescending and not rolling their eyes all the time and huffing and puffing. Oh, God, he's asking the question again. Why doesn't he already know? Well, you know what? Sometimes you need to hear something two or three times before it sticks. Sometimes you need to do it yourself before it sticks. You can't, you know, you can't just rattle off a bunch of gear ratios at a newbie and expect them to, to rush out to the store and buy the right thing. They're going to go, oh, shit, there's gear ratios that I need to be aware of and pick the right ones. And then they're going to go to the store with 100 gear options and have no idea what to pick. So give them time to learn, you know. Let them drive one of your cars, you know, have a car to loan. There's so many ways you can be helpful and not be a jerk. If the only reason you're in that club is to win all the time and you want to hold newbies back from being able to win by keeping them in the dark about whatever you're doing to your cars, you're a jerk. Just, put a, just wear a sign that says, I'm a jerk, don't ask me questions. rant over. <laughs> if anybody else would like to pitch in on that, I'm certainly willing to let you or change my mind. Uh, I, I think, I, I think what, that, you, go ahead, I think what you described, what you described actually was Formula One. Uh, it, and I'm, it exists in all levels, I'm sure. It's just human nature. But you know what? There's lots of human nature things that we shouldn't be doing. So just just fight it, use your brain, think, oh no, yes, I wanna win, but winning is a lot more fulfilling and meaningful when you're racing against somebody who has a chance to beat you. That's right, I was gonna say, there, there, are two, there are two sayings that I know about. One is that, you know, motor racing, and that includes slot car racing, is the only sport where the value of your win depends on the quality of your competition, right? So uh, it doesn't help to win by 50 laps. A win by a tenth of a second is a lot more fun than winning by 50 laps. Uh, most of the time, you know, now and then it's nice to beat the jerks by 50 laps is really nice. Yeah, the, um, the, the motto of my analog club is it's more fun to lose by an inch than to win by a mile. Yeah. That's or zero. my saying is don't box with a 10 year old. <laughs> Especially your 10 year old. <laughs> Okay, so that topic, yeah, you know, well, you know, on that topic, you know, you talk about that, and even for some of us experienced guys, you know, what I found is is that you want your club to be welcoming to both new people and to people who are always at the back of the pack. You know, I mean, you know, I, I look at clubs, and the, you know, there's a club in my area. I used to go there every week. Now I very seldomly show up. And it's not because I'm right at the back marker. Every now and then I'll have a car that's tuned so well that that I can get up there and, you know, box it out for a podium spot. Um, but, you know, there's a there's about three guys who are always in the front. And of, you know, I'd say 14 or 15 people that don't all show up at the same time, but usually the group's about 9 to 11. And the same three seem to win almost always. And then once in a while, somebody else will creep in when a guy, when one of those three winners crashes or their car fails or something like that. But yeah, I think about that and I think about myself and I, and I ask this question, if I'm gonna go there and you know, uh, sometimes the, the group is not as, I guess, receptive to who I am or what my personality is, so that bugs some guys and they'll think, well, Phil's too talkative. And I, I know that. So when I hear that, I think, well, you don't really want me to come here and get to know you or let you get to know me because I'm trying to go to people's pits and learn things. And as well, I'm trying to go and make sure that everybody feels like, hey, you know what? When I go there, somebody cared that I was there for the... 35 or 40 minutes worth of track time that you get on a race day and you're there four or five hours, well, it's a lot easier for me to go just to my right over here and there's a, a track that's 
my table's one foot shorter and one foot more narrow than the track that I that our club uses. So I can I can drive nowhere and go to my own track and have people come over and help them become hobbyists, or I can go to a hostile environment and spend time trying to create some camaraderie, trying to create some buzz. So when people leave the, the track, they're like, man, I was there. I met this guy. He was a lot of fun. You know, I, you know, we socialize. I want to go there again and maybe end up with a friend who's slot car racing instead of just a co-member in the club. So I think there's a lot of things that people, Greg, you, you talk about that, that I think I watch clubs and I watch them not grow at all and someone drops off, two or three people drop off. And then over the course of a year, maybe two or three people join back in. So the club's never really grown. And as I look at that, I always ask myself the question, what's happening there? You know, uh, you know, in a club where everyone's got to build a car and they got to spend a lot of money, I think that's that hurts. You know, uh, when you got to figure out tuning motor pods, when you've got to deal with, you know, magnet marshals, our club races magnets, but you got a magnet marshal, that's a $150 device to measure your magnet. There's all really only one way to do that in the marketplace these days I know of, you know, then you've got to figure out how to chew your tires. You got to figure out how to get a motor pod. By the time you figure all that stuff out, you kind of lose the wind in your sails. So to go along with what Greg is saying, I'm saying, hey, you know, when you are trying to grow your club, when you're trying to grow an opportunity, you have to make it affordable and you have to make it accessible. And that's just not keeping good hours. That's making it accessible as in, I show up, I slap, if it's a plastic track, I slap some silicones on it. If it's a wood track, maybe some urethanes, you know, or there's just a stock class and you just get out some sandpaper and you go. And, and so, you know, I, I hope that if, if people see this in the future, they think, how can we incorporate that into our racing so that people who just show up, who have a, a car out of a set, it's not super detailed. And some clubs will go, well, you have to have a super a high detail car. It's got to have a driver in it, got to have an interior, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's great, except most of the kits don't come with that. So when I show up with my my nine-year-old and we love racing at home and we came to your thing and then you're kind of telling us well we'll let you run now but we really don't run those cars that, that don't look like you know the real you know scale model with the with the driver and stuff in it and you know those things I think are a hindrance to to groups and I'd like to see groups do more to attract that youth you know. But you know, and you felt, you felt, you, but you felt, I think, hit the nail on the head. It's like any other group activity. It really comes down to the integrity and and the aim of the members themselves. Yeah, yeah. And it, we always you know, said, we always said, the rules don't kick in until you start winning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Or you know, if you're if you're an established club and you and you know most of your guys like you know racing the 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 highly tuned or modified or you know the the more expensive cars and you want more members which honestly some clubs just don't want more members and yeah you know, fine if they wanted to slowly die off that's cool that's them assuming you want new members then like Phil is saying is just have a have a, a variety of classes that that people can race with you know you might come on on NSR race night uh, with your skill extra and that's your first yeah. time you say oh okay, it's a nice car and let them let them drive it around the track Tonight is NSR race night. Here's a car you can borrow if you want. Uh, mm -hmm. Tomorrow night is electric stock race night or, or whatever, you know, however your club works, yeah. have, as, have as wide a variety of racing classes from yeah. out of the box. So there's very little, you know, monetary outlay to, you know, hundred dollar cars with another hundred dollars in parts in them. So that the guys who are just all about that can yeah. enjoy it as well. Yeah. Yeah, and then just and then just be helpful for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, you know, COVID right now. I was I was reading something that you had posted. Uh, one of the guys was saying he wasn't going to be able to make it because his club was racing on Wednesdays. And you, Greg, commented that. Well, I tried going, but you know, 
you need to, in this day and age, you also have to kind of accommodate the people who are going to be even more nervous, say, about COVID, right? I mean, that's a real deal. You know, uh, I was just at an event uh, in our community and, uh, you know, it, it had a lot of families in a, in a setting and they could come through this slot car track and, you know, the kids were coming in and they were running. And I was asked, you know, could I come out and do a shift or two there? So I got myself together and ran out there. But when I went out there, I stopped. I got some spray disinfectant, a couple rolls of paper towels. I got, you know, a, a box of uh, latex gloves, right? Or, or plastic gloves, you know, in case someone had a, a latex uh, allergy. So I got these, these plastic gloves to put on. So anyone could come in and get a pair of gloves if they want their kids to have them, or at least disinfect the, the controllers between uh, people who pick the controller up. And then I wore my mask the entire time, you know. And, uh, you know, for me that, you know, I've had a family member die. I've got a mother-in-law, three sister-in-laws and a brother-in-law who all are at varying levels of, of COVID-19 positive all the way from I'm just sleeping at home and can't wake up to I'm in a hospital in a respirator. Um, you know, my, my ex-mother-in-law's uh, male companion died, you know, two days before I was at this event from real COVID symptoms. And, you know, uh, there was a guy who told me it's, it's complete fictitious farce, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, okay, that, that, that's your opinion. I appreciate that. But to me, it's very real. And I'll tell you why. And I told him, I said, you know, my cousin has died. Two of my radio control car uh, acquaintances, they died, you know, the guy's brother and his dad died. I mean, it was just, it's real, you know, and I'm not a guy who was wearing a mask two of them everywhere I go, but I'm, I try to at least respect other people's need to, for me to have them feel safe when I come into a public arena or into their environment. And so, you know, I, 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 I think those are really important things in this day and age. Uh, and again, you know, it's not about the politics. It's, you know, uh, it, it's not about who's in the limelight or not, but I, I'd love to see slot cars, uh, you know, doing more, you know, I mean, I give away sets so I can seed people to do more. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's a never happen. ending challenge of, yeah. of our yeah. hobby is, is getting more people in. So it's yeah. just, it's very frustrating when you know that there are clubs out there that are not it, enabling people to get into the hobby. Graham, did you have something you wanted to say? I, I saw you kind of pitching in earlier. Well, I, I belong to the one, one full size show car world. And I've been doing that for many years. And there are people like that in there too. All their cleaning and detail items and stuff. They masking tape, all the labels and the bottles. And you don't stand a chance. You don't get to see what they're using, how they finish their exhaust manifolds or you know, or what they're using to do final detail on tires or anything like that. Just, just stuff like that. They actually go the trouble to masking tape the bottles out, or they put it all in generic bottles. And that, those are those are grown ups with big money. <laughs> and uh, and then we had to make sure as a club, we had to make sure that when if we saw new people talking to that fellow, Mister X, we had to make sure we get a hold of him after and go. That's not the way it is, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But there's always a few people that at the, that level, whatever level, they will, uh, they'll do stuff that really doesn't invite, you know, like new people. They see that kind of thing going on. They go, well, I don't think I want to play here. Like the guy wouldn't even tell me. And it's a common question. You know, what kind of wax do you use? What do you use on your tires? How did you finish your exhaust manifold? You know, those kind of final detail things and the people go, well, that's a secret. Well, it doesn't make it happen. And like with slot car stuff too. Oh, well, I, I you can't look under the body of my car. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, it, it does happen. You just have to make sure the new people don't take that as the full deal that everybody's like that, right? 
Yeah, well, and to, to your point, Graham, and, and I know you'll understand this as well as Luff, you don't want to play with anybody who doesn't pass the puck. Yes. I mean, the, 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 the people who are not like that, uh, hopefully, are being proactive, like you said, you know, catch the guy and say, you know, that guy is, you know, he's just him, right? We're not all like that. So, you know, whenever we have new people in the club, you know, sure, there's a couple of guys who, who would rather just race and, and not be the, the teacher, right? But we have other people who are like, hey, you know, welcome to the club. You know, here's a car you can borrow if yours isn't to spec. And here's how I set my car up and just all that stuff, you know. I, I understand that there's always going to be the guys who don't want to help or share. But it really sucks when you've got a club that's mostly that. And they're all just like, they're all best buddies and they all race the same, you know, same cars and the same tunings. And, you know, they all, they share their little, you know, secret sauce for the tires and stuff like that. And then somebody comes in and they're like, oh yeah, just keep track, keep practicing. You'll be fine. <laughs> if, that's, if I may. Um, yeah. who, who, okay, hold on. I heard Chris. I think I heard Chris earlier. So Chris, I'm going to let you go. Okay, um, this attitude, Greg, I, I, it's a lot more prevalent than you think. Um, and to be honest with you, there's really bugger all you're gonna do about it. Um, it's, it's, you know, this forums or, or this Zoom's a good, a, a good example. Um, I get quite a few guys on the various forums sending me private messages saying, you know, in our club, nobody will tell me, can you help me and stuff like that. Um, so you try and do what you can do. Um, you know, there's, there's, <clears throat> I guess my sort of philosophy was molded early on when I was probably 14 or 15. Um, I was taken under the big guys wings at a lot of the racetracks and they'd help me build motors and build frames and do stuff. So it, it just seemed like that's what you did. So, um, but that's not the way everybody does it. And it happens in go-karts and Formula One. And if you're a florist or if you're waxing, whatever, whatever there is, there's people that are going to help you and there's people that are not that are small minded enough. And for God's sake, we're playing with toy cars for Christ's sake. It's not, you know, if I was, if, if the race next weekend was worth a hundred thousand dollars, I'd likely change my attitude, but it's not, it's just for, you know, bragging rights, playing with toy cars. So, um, you know, certainly when, when you said you had people, um, calling you, I'll, I mean, if, if there's, you know, if there's anything that you ever feel is beyond your realm of, of knowledge and stuff, you know, I know Dennis would say the same, like, by all means, pass them on to, uh, pass them on, um, you know, and, and on to Phil's point about clubs, I, I sort of disagree with you. A, a club by its nature has you join a golf club, you're going to go there to play golf. Um, you can't go there and go, well, how come it's not a curling club? Well, no, it's not. This is, it's, it's a golf club. So you do have, each club has the right to, um, you know, some of their little foibles. We've got a couple of clubs that are very uh, particular and sticklish on their, it's a model car racing club. It's not a slot car club. So, you know, you want to have an accurate livery and all the rest of the stuff and all the guys in the club like that. So when someone shows up with something that's not like that, you may say, okay, the first week's a freebie, but, um, and, and most of the guys in that club will say, okay, here's how you do it. Here's what you buy. Here's how you put decals on. Here's how you do this and do this. Um, but you can't have one size all fits clubs. Um, you know, that's the, the nature of a club. Um, our clubs are all analog clubs. They're not digital clubs and we're not going digital. So you don't have to provide everything to every single person. You do need to be respectful of people. And, you know, I don't expect that 
we're going to get a lot of digital racers in our club, and that's fine. Um, but we certainly want to hold on to the people that we do have and share a common interest. And it's in our best interests to, you know, I, I mean, I've spent tons of times at, at, at slot car tracks helping out on weekends just because I like hanging out at slot car tracks on weekends. And if I can get more people into the store for the owners to buy parts, I got to go, I got a place to go and hang out for longer. Um, you know, so if I, if I try and defeat my club and close my club down by being a dick, I can certainly do that, but I'm the one who loses, not anyone else. Cause I like hanging out at the place. So anyway. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, every club can't beat every club, right? If, I mean, if you're, if your club is primarily, you know, magless on a plastic track with slotted and NSRs, then you're not going to be wanting to have a, a stock scale extra magnet class or, or you know there's there's stuff you, you can't even do if you wanted to you know hjo cars or 124 cars you can't really do it on a, a scale extra no. you know plastic track no, but absolutely. absolutely yeah i mean we get guys coming out to the club and they decide for whatever reason um racing around on a wood track without magnets is not for them so fine it's not for you um and our guys will say well what do you want to do well i want to race ho cars okay well that's a you know fine here's an ho club or here's a digital club or you know we're not putting in an ho track because greg shows up and he wants to race ho, <laughs> race HO cars ain't yeah. gonna happen um but you can do it respectfully and 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 try and you know improve the hobby you don't have to try and it doesn't have to be one thing for everybody yeah and 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 i was gonna say you just hit, you know pointed out the other thing is is when somebody comes to investigate your club and, and see what it's all about and and they're not feeling it suggest other clubs i mean right. if, if you, you're obviously not going to get that person in your club so it's not going to hurt you to send them to another club you well, know. And there's, you know, I mean, there's, um, you know, we've got uh, a, a big club that's sort of in hold right now, obviously, with things being the way they are, which is mini grid. And, and every race, we average about 25 guys every Thursday night. And it used to be 30, and then it used to be 20, because it's, it's, it's personalities, like you, you can't, you know, you put 25 guys or 30 guys in a room and we're not all best buddies. Like it, it just, it's not going to happen. There's going to be somebody you think is a dick or he thinks you're a dick or whatever. And it is what it is, but um, you know, you just try and be respectful and you, you gain some and lose some, but um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, the, the example is what I was just today, I was working on Ernie's new track, which is, which is a wood track it's going to have glue on it and it's going to be for fast cars with sponge tires and that's what we're running on that track so when guys come in we say okay these cars are three hundred dollars or whatever they are and you go from there well i just like to take my scale electrics car out of the box and run it around well i'm sure you would but it's not going to happen you know you go to the plastic track downstairs and do that and do this and, and stuff like that so you know, you do have to have a certain set of rules. It's what a club is. Um, you know, if I go to my golf club and show up wearing, you know, whatever I might want to wear, they, you know, the president goes, no, Chris, you're not, you're not doing that. Anymore, right? This is, this is what we're doing right here. So, you know, I got a choice. I can quit or I can, you know, sort of mold in a little. Bit. So anyway, that's my rant over. Nope. Good stuff. I love all perspectives. And, and like I said, I, I didn't, I mean, I kind of went pretty far with my ranting. I didn't really mean that every club should try to be every club. They try to accommodate everybody. Obviously that's, that's no, not. It's, 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 you get that, you know, at the commercial tracks, it's, um, I guess as you get a little bit older and if you've actually won a race or two, going through time winning the next race is really not all that important like it's it's a slot car race it's not if you've never won one the first one's a big one 
But if you want a few, it's sort of, well, you know, it's, it's just not that important. You know, I mean, I don't when I when I race at our club, I do not race to lose. I race to win. Um, but if anybody asks me any question whatsoever about the car or the controller or how I drive or whatever, I'm more than happy to share. So I'd like to improve the breed um, as opposed to, you know, lowering the common denominator which is me or something like that so and i think if you're i, I think if you're open um you know you join any kind of a christ you join a ping pong club you're not going to go in the first day and beat the club champ like you gotta you know but if if the club champion says do this and help you know try this and this and this and if you can see a progression in yourself and you're getting closer to the top what more can you ask for Yep. If I may, can I piggyback on that a little bit? This is Brian Giprich here speaking up, by the way. Go for it, Brian. Um, I, I go by Gipper on the forum. I hang out mainly at the HRW. You, I'm not real active. I've been messing with these for about a decade now, but uh, kind of one of those things that comes around. But what Chris was talking about, you know, at everything I've ever been part of that was competitive, whether it was archery, RC cars, I don't race slot cars competitively, but anything, there are always those individuals who A, will not share information, or B, are more than happy to share their information. I'm gonna kind of take the flip side on this, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the newcomers. The biggest problem I see with them, and, and I've always been very forthcoming with information, is a lot of them coming in have unrealistic expectations. For example, they're just getting started in slot car racing. They bought their, their high-end car last week. They showed up at the track this week. They didn't do well. You offered some advice, and next week they expect to be on the podium type thing. So, I mean, there is a little bit of give and take on both sides of this. You know, and I think someone, uh, I do a lot of, uh, I was an, in, an instructor for a lot of years um, with the military. So dealing mainly with younger people with very little life experience and I was trying to teach them meteorology. So you can imagine the challenge in that. Um, but again, I think letting them know that even if I share every secret I have with you, doesn't guarantee the same results as I'm getting. If it was that easy, there's a handful of guys on my screen right now that could probably prep cars and sell them for a gazillion dollars a piece because everyone they sold would be a winner. It's just not that easy. So I think when we're talking about dealing with the newer people in this, this hobby, we also have to make sure they understand the fact that just because you have a well-prepped car doesn't mean you're going to win. I mean, I, I love there, for example, I mean, I've been dabbling in and out of these things for a couple of decades. I actually grew up around this. My dad was a toy maker. Um, you know, I've, I know who that man is from surfing forums and bulletin boards decades ago. It would be unrealistic for me to ex expect to show up with my first car at his track and be competitive. So yes, I'm all about nurturing the new people, being forthcoming with your information, but also you have to make sure they have realistic expectations because I've also encountered people that no matter what you tell them, it's either they'll disregard what you tell them and think you're holding back on them or it's not enough, or um, they don't want to take the baby steps it takes to get to a certain level of competitive effectiveness. You know, like you said, no one was born with this knowledge. You know, it was acquired over time and through experience. So sometimes you gotta, it, it's going to be painful for them. Yeah, you, you know, and to me, it's not even also so much being forthcoming with the information, but being supportive of their effort, period. You know, the fact, encourage them to keep coming back. Hey, you're going to get better. We'll help you. You know, things are going to change. Your skills are going to improve. Um, Mr. Kidd, I think if I'm not mistaken from watching some of your stuff, you you actually raced one-to-one -one race cars quite extensively. Mm -hmm. I'm sure mm -hmm. you weren't kicking ass and taking names the first time you sat in one of those cars. Oh, you know, no, so again. I, I, I can tell you my very first start, uh, which was at the back of the grid, just going, you know, the first thing you think about is, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, and then you're absolutely right, but you know, and, and it, but it's, you know, it was 
a club. We had uh, eight to nine people who I lovingly called the more money than talent group. And these guys, a lot of them raced really serious. I mean, I, serious racing. A couple of them were wealthy enough to race uh, in a Porsche Cup series. But the first thing they did out of the car after practice was say, hey, listen, I was following you for two laps. You know, you're, you're hitting the apex okay, but you're not coming away from it fast enough. Like, let the car drift away more, you'll be able to go faster. And that was the ethos of what we were doing. You know, um, absolutely right. Everyone was there to help each other out because, you know, your life is at risk. <laughs> uh, and it was, you know, we'd be doing 160 miles an hour down a straight. So, yeah, no, it's, but it's, it's the same thing. I also play hockey and I play hockey, believe it or not, with ex-professional hockey players. And it, it, you talk about a, a club environment. We have acquired 20 individuals who have the same ethos, which is absolutely unreasonable, uh, incredible. And we don't let those people go. And the ethos for playing hockey with our group is intensity with respect. And it, it works. And we get pros coming up saying, you know, you guys are a really good bunch of guys. Like everybody's going hard for the puck, but nobody's getting hurt. How do you do that? And I've, I've, I've been asked to play with other pros where I'll go, nope. Because after the first five minutes, the, the pro kicks in and they're banging each other into the boards. It's like, no, nah, it's not for me. So you're absolutely right. It's 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 very very similar, and I, I you know it, I, I'm very much convinced that it comes down to the the ethos of the group and the individuals involved having enough. You know, because I even when I played hockey, I never I was never a great hockey player. But when I started, they'd still pass me the puck. I'd lose it, but they'd pass the puck. And hockey is like that very much. If you don't pass the puck, you don't get asked back to play. Yeah, it's it's I think anything competitive endeavor friendly competitive endeavor but it's a give and take on both sides so again yes there's always those people who have more money than sense or or think that money is what's going to make them competitive in some cases it helps but there's also a talent there so i, I think we we also need to help these newbie balance their expectations you know uh, I, I agree with you brian if I, guitar you, players you, the best the best thing you can do for a tone on a guitar is practice it's not well, buying a new amp or buy a new cable it's practice playing that guitar. Well, there you go. And if, if you're a player, I, I, I play as well. And you know, the first two <sighs> things that you do when you're playing is be in tune and be in time. And everything else kind of comes from that. Yeah, I, Brian, excellent point. Uh, and it, I, I've definitely seen a few, uh, I've seen my share of, of newbies come into the club and, and get frustrated that you know, they've got the car, you know, it's, it's, it's set up just, just like the other guys that are winning and they've got a nice controller and they're just, they just can't figure out why they're not winning. And it's like, yeah, you got it. It takes time. You're not going to, you know, it just because the car is in a slot doesn't make the whole thing easy. It's, it, there's, there's a skill that you have to develop over time. Yeah. And most of those guys were losers racing on plastic digital tracks anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Greg, that was straight at you. Yeah, I'm a I sport track, I'm, I, and I'm a magnet racer. So I guess I'm really the bottom of the pile there. So that was just a cheap shot on my part. Sorry, I had to take it. I guess I'll oh, change sorry. my backdrop. Yeah. All well, right. I, I could have shot that at you too, Phil, but the motorcycles are too cool. So you got to pass on that one. Hey, I've got chipped motorcycles. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have anything they want to chip in? Because I kind of want to move on to the questions that this person was asking. Is anybody, everybody ready for that one? Yes, sir. This is out of my, out of like I said, this is out of my wheelhouse. I just run stock most of the time, or if they say change it, I, I put in whatever they say. So, so bear with me, I'm gonna to go to the messages that I was sent uh, and I'm just gonna read through it. So, so give me a minute to get through it. And uh, I can always go back to these messages if you, <laughs> if you didn't catch something that I read here. Uh, so he's setting up a Porsche GT1 Evo. I'm thinking slot it. He, want, he needs to change or, or is, is wanting to change from angle, wire, angle winder to inline. He has to use an MX-16 or Piranha motor. I don't even know what those two motors are. MX-16 is a slotted motor. Yeah, I figured. It, it, he wants to stay with a one millimeter offset for wheel size, and that's what it came with. It's just in angle winder format. And he's lost on the gears. His idea was to put a one millimeter offset in line with a nine tooth pinion and a 25 tooth offset crown. 
Is one millimeter offset right? Can I get away with 0.5 and lower the car? You know, he's got all these kind of questions and, and I'm sure there is some limitations that he, he, you know, has to work within, but without going into the math of it, how, how much does he need to worry about it? I mean, I already, already impressed on him that, you know, learning to drive is, is number one, you know, you can have a perfect setup car and still drive poorly, but why why does he want to go to an inline or is we just take that as that's what he wants to do and just go from there or i i think that he wants to he, he's fairly new to the hobby and so he he kind of wants to experience the options my guess is that is that the the club spec is is mainly the motors and that he has a fairly open option as far as inline angle winder sidewinder and offsets and stuff like that as long as the other thing too the is that the other thing too is that uh, if he has a, the original Porsche, it's got the long can angle winder part, and uh, mm. most people don't realize that you can actually put a short can in there. Uh, you know, they look at it and they say, "Oh, the short can won't fit because it's too small." Well, yeah, it, you you can still put it in. Um, the MX-16 is the is the the regular uh, orange and bell 23k. Um, slotted short can motor okay and so it's very similar to the piranha either one of those would be pretty good yeah. um, okay so the mx-16 and the piranha are basically the same very similar in it's, performance yeah yeah okay um, De dennis would you suggest that he stay angle wider or go in line well it, it uh, <laughs> i mean that depends, it depends on, on the, well you know it, it depends on the track it depends on the tires it depends on a, a number of things yeah. right uh, I would probably, rather than go in line, I would probably go full sidewinder uh, with a with a with a that. But I mean, if the guy had, if he's if he's looking to do it on a budget, what I would do is I would pull the pull the flat six motor out that's in the the angle winder pod right now. I'd pull the pinion off it. I'd put the pinion on the end of the MX sixteen, and I'd screw it back in there, and I would run it. Right, I mean, just a, the, just a straight motor go. swap. Just a straight motor swap. There's going to be a big hole, or a lot of a lot of air at one end of the at one end of the pod, uh, because the motor is shorter. Uh, if he wanted to, maybe a little bit of hot glue just to hold that end of the motor in place. Uh, but two screws into the into the into the can end where it drives uh, would be enough. Uh, I would run with the Sangira show to start with. And um, and there you go. Um, the car will probably handle better anyway because uh, of the lighter motor. And uh, the only issue that you might have is whether it still fits under the body, because those cars, the you know the the, the short can motors are taller than the flat six motors, so you would have to think about that. I, I think the boxers will fit as well as the uh, MX-16s, they'll fit as a sidewinder, but I don't think they'll fit as an inline. Oh, as an inline, it's got almost no chance, I would think. Yeah, yeah you're think right. The, I think the interior blocks it. But if he's sticking with sidewinder and he moves from the flat six to the MX-16, then it's mainly just the height difference that'll, that could interfere with the body work. Uh, the yeah, and, work. and way back there, it may not be a problem as RK okay, was saying. Yeah, well, and also don't forget, because you've got the brush bulge on any of the S cans, which you don't have yeah. on the flat six. Yeah, sure. But because the motor is shorter, that places the brush bulge right underneath the center line of the body, so you're fine. Uh, Yep, I'd have to look at one of those cars. Yeah, no, you're fine with that. So, I mean, just get a new motor, Greg, and tell them to bolt it right into the um, angle winder. You don't need adapters. That's complete. That's not true. Guys have been bolting motors onto uh, bulkheads like that for 65 years now, and it works just fine. I think um, they call that marketing. <laughs> well, they call it, yeah, they call it whatever they call it. But, um, and then, you, you know, as Dennis said, you need more info. What's the tracks? What, what, is it a six foot straight or a 22 foot straight or, or, um, 
I think one of the frustrations was that uh, probably because the the rules are fairly open with regards to gear ratios and, and motor setup is that you know he he's trying to figure out which is which is going to be the best bang for buck or or whatever and you know guys are running different things you know in his club so he's getting different answers from the guys in the club he goes online and does some research you know and finds other people setting up their cars you know yeah. and gets different information there it's like well you know what information do i do i follow well, you know, well, I mean, I, certainly getting rid of the uh, S-can or getting rid of the flat six and putting the S-can, that weighs about nine to 10 grams less. So that reduces the polar moment of inertia on the car, which if you've ever driven an old one-to-one -one Porsche 911 with the engine out the back, once it's gone, you ain't getting it back. And that's, that's the same in swap car. So, um, you know, lots of different variables on yeah, actually, I'm just looking at with the, one of the slotted um, 911s. There's plenty of space yeah, under yeah, there yeah. for an inline. Absolutely no problem whatsoever because the, co the cockpit stops right there. Yeah. So back here, there's a lot of space. The only problem may be clearance for the gear right in the middle there. But I think it probably would fit. Uh, there shouldn't be a problem with that. So he could do it either way, but for, for, for handling-wise, the sidewinder would probably be a better bet. Yeah, and if, if there was a, an issue with gear, he could drop down to an eight-tooth pinion and a lower-tooth uh, spur on that. True. Or contrary, sorry. Yeah. So all, all doable, Greg. Um, to give a better answer, we need more, like, to... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look to see if you... do a whole bunch of different stuff. It depends on what what's what's his goal and what are the constraints of the track and the rules and stuff like that there's another little piece of advice for a newbie as well and that is it's all very well to ask all kinds of people and to look at everything that's on the internet but until you know uh the the background to each guy's answer you're going to get so many different answers you're going to really be in trouble so within a club the way to do that is to find somebody who is, how should we say, whose attitude to the, to the racing is similar to the way you want to race and try and work with one guy. Uh, trying, to, trying to get information from three or four guys is very often not going to help. You know, I can think of guys that I've raced with on a Thursday night at the, at the commercial track, right? And there'll be five guys running the same chassis and every one of them set up differently. And if you were to go and ask one guy, he'll say, well, this is what you need to do. And you ask the next guy, he'll say, oh, no, that's rubbish. That doesn't work. You've got to do this and this. You ask the third guy and neither of the first two were right. You ask the fourth guy and neither of the last three were right. Then you come and ask me and I'll say, well, I don't use that chassis at all because it doesn't work <laughs> or whatever, right? So you go... You go, if you're a new guy, what you've got to do is you've got to decide, okay, is there somebody here that I, you know, like Phil was saying, is there somebody here that's, that, that looks friendly, who seems to know what he's doing? Let me start there and start with one guy and stay with one guy uh, and not try to, and not try to, um, to play one off against the other or even to ask one off against the other. And, you know, picking up stuff off the internet is fine, but you've got to be so careful Jesus. That, that, the in, that the information you're getting is valid. Well, you know, I think that the, to, to follow on what Chris is saying, uh, but also with when Gipper was talking earlier, you know, when you, whenever you're in something competitive, uh, you have to find somebody who can help you uh, go from being, you know, a, a, a grasshopper, you know, if you want to be a master in Taekwondo, you know, one of the things that, that uh, when I fought a lot, um, I learned very quickly, one, find somebody who was good, who could instruct me and watch what I was doing, and then not try to learn everything from them at the first tournament. You know, that, that was the number one thing, you know, the first few tournaments I lost, and I lost big time, you know, and then 
uh, I found somebody and I said, hey, I want you to be the guy in my corner all the time. When we're in the school, I want to work with you all the time. I didn't try to become that person. I didn't try to adapt his fighting style. What I tried to do was learn how to adopt my own fighting style at the same time. And in slot cars, you know, I, I kind of try to do that same thing when, when new members come in. You know, you know, going back to what Chris was saying, the club's got its rules. They're all published. You know, so you're not trying to take the club and change it so that this newbie can come in and alter the rules so they they can do well. But what you do want to do is adopt someone who's coming in and then have them take off small pieces. You know, if they're on the internet seeing all kinds of stuff, what you say is, look, we're going to have a program to try to help bring you along. And I think, you know, we're talking about this GT1, you know, if you swap out the engine, and now you've taken care of some weight issues and you've taken care of some motor performance issues. I think at that point, you tell that person, listen, you can make 20 new adjustments to this car, but you're not going to understand the effect of any of them if you do them all at once. So in your next fight, go out and try these three moves. If you score, then you know you've gotten these well. If you don't, then you need to, you know, you need to come back and work on those first. And then eventually you'll build up a skill set. So when you get on the track, you know, maybe you don't win, but you could you could lead a lap, you know, just one, you know, or not be last anymore, just once. You know, I mean it, it is kind of that way, you know, you do have to take a small piece and then let all the reading and all the anecdotes and all the stories that people tell you let that be cumulative knowledge that you store away to later validate through your own experience points. I, I think that that's a number one thing in this hobby is it is that unrealistic expectation. Well, I got this car. I went over. Two of the guys who went all the time said, do all this stuff. I did it all. It's not working. You know, why aren't I winning? <laughs> like I used to say at the motorcycle track, listen, man, it's not the bike. It's the rider. Yeah. The problem is the control interface between the handlebars and the seat and the pedals is not functioning properly. Yeah. So, you know, I don't care if you felt your knee touching the ground, your knee is not riding that motorcycle. You are. The loose nut behind the wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did you have, Graham? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I think the idea agreeing with, you know, what Phil says too is somewhat if you're going to be a mentor or, or at least help this guy move along is to you know, maybe advise him to make a change that could be worth something and then, but go out and be aware of that change and how your car reacts to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that way you'll learn more. And then if he wants, you know, it's just a motor. If he wants to put the motor in, leave it as angle winder, side winder, drive the car, see what difference that made. And if he really, for some reason wants to go in line because somebody told him that by all means, go to inline, give that a try, you know, but be aware, you know, this is what you should be looking for. You're new here, but you know, will does the car feel better when you're running it? But uh, you know, like Phil says, don't make 10 changes. I think everybody agrees. You don't make 10 changes to the yeah. thing and then go out there and go, Hey, that ain't work. Yeah. You know, what ain't but, <laughs> I had, yeah. I had 10 new moves and I still got my butt kicked. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> you didn't do any of those. Well, <laughs> But you know, you're, Phil, you're right. What it takes, I guess, is a little bit of self-discipline to only yeah. go yeah. progressively, right? Yeah, you yeah. have to go progress. You know, get the motor, put it in there. Don't change the motor pod from angle wider to, to inline. Just put the motor in. The motor, you yeah. can always decide to add the expense of going to inline later because there is it, it's, it's not big money, right? I mean, yeah. all of us, you know, who have more than a handful of cars, you know, if you bought the six car set and you no longer have six cars because you have some more cars, it's not the expense of that 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 inline uh, motor pod that's going to make the difference to you. It's, that's not the money that you're trying to save. It's the headache, you know. The, and so the best always, thing always try to go with, hey, let's look at your ride height. You know, let's look to see, you know, if your car is sitting square. Because if it's not, I could tell you to go, you know, a boil and then wait down the chassis or put it in the oven or something. 
you know, but I might also tell you, maybe you shouldn't be trying to adjust this chassis. Maybe you should just go get another chassis because your car is crooked. So or I maybe say- Maybe screw is too tight somewhere. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I tell, I tell new guys all the time, take this car, take it apart and put it back together and don't over tighten anything and then set it on a flat, you know, if you don't have a, a tech block, you know, then set it on a flat piece of, you know, set a piece of track on a flat table, you know, preferably not like a nylon spun plastic table that can be warped or crazy, but get yourself a nice flat new piece of wood, set your piece of track on it. And if it sits flat, put your car on it and then look, just look down the track and see if, if all the tires are at least close to the same distance from the track, if nothing's touching, your crown gear is too big. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's yeah. definitely, you know, a thousand and one things to, that can be done. But do the base level first. The basics, yeah, and, and take do it the base level. Step, and don't change too many things at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Then make one change and go out and run that car. Run it as a base. If you have a track available, run it on the track and then test it at its base level. And then swap your motor, you know, and then after you take, take the electric motor and you swap it, if you can go to that same track and run again, you can figure out what happened to your baseline. And if it gets better, then you can say, hey, I got time before the next race to make one more change or not. But I wouldn't change, you know, six different things and then get to the track because a novice is going to make those changes. Then they're going to get to the track and it's going to work horribly. And then, and then they're trying to fix six problems that they added to that car instead of, <laughs> instead yep, of yep. one. <laughs> you know, well, so. I think we pretty much covered this topic. Thank you very much. You, you yeah. are quite uh, uh, talkative, like you said. <laughs> Sorry. So that's okay. I uh, just want to make sure we don't run out of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I do have one other topic that I wanted to bring up. But... Sorry, one, one quick. If he needs any more help, Greg, um, feel free to pass on emails or whatever you need to do. Yeah, sure. Me too. Yep. Yeah, with Dennis. And I think that just, Greg, just quickly, um, this brings to, brings another point up about, about clubs and how we were talking about clubs earlier on. Uh, all of this is difficult to do on a race night. Yeah. It's much nicer when clubs have a pre-planned test and tune or a pre-planned occasion where they concentrate on helping other people or new guys to set their cars up. And uh, that, I think, works a lot better than trying to, you know, the, you know than, than the poor guy trying to get help on race night when everybody's busy trying to beat everybody yeah good point anyway, yeah. And, yeah and i remember in, in, when i was when i was just starting out one of the guys took me under his wing and, and was kind of helping me mm -hmm. learn and stuff and and whenever we would race at his track he would let me stay a little bit longer or come a little bit earlier and and you know just practice and and you know we could talk you know and he could teach me things yeah. and, and mm -hmm. i could you know just start can start that slow process of getting better. That's the way. Yeah. Whenever I, whenever I've mentored somebody in that, or, or at least tried to help somebody, or think I'm helping them, I try and get them to be aware of what the changes are. Not just right. come to me and ask for the change, and then do it, and then come back to me and go, "Well, that didn't work." I'll ask them, "Well, why didn't it work? Did were you aware of the change, right?" And like you say, practice nights versus race nights, Dennis is we used to go auto crossing and on an auto cross day when you're actually competing, you know, as a group against some other groups, that's, that's not the time to be playing with tire pressures and wondering if you're doing the right thing. You only get certain time on the track. So, but we used to have practice days and when new people, we would invite them out on practice days and we go, okay, now drop your tire pressure two pounds and go out and tell me if you notice a difference. You know, and then you get another opportunity to, you know, drop it two more pounds and then notice the difference. But you try and get the person to be aware of the changes, not tell them what to do, but Correct. suggest something and get them to be aware of that. 
And maybe that's the way they run. Different people, like you say, we talked before, run different cars, different setups. But, you know, that guy will come out and say, well, you know, I, I prefer the angle winder setup. You're right. I tried the inline and it didn't work for me. And then you want to make them aware of, you know, why it might not have worked better, you know. So. Yeah, great, great point. As a mentor, I tried to get them to learn that, you know. Yeah, one one of the frustrating one of the reasons I was kind of ranty, and thanks for letting me get out of my out of my system, uh, was that, uh, like I said, I couldn't help him directly because I I was not into that, but I knew a, a couple of guys, you know, and I and I had a couple emails that I could send to, and I sent uh, this person's contact information to the guys that that were helpful to me, and. I don't, you know, they're, they're not on the internet 24 seven, like I am. So maybe they just haven't gotten around to it, but he hasn't gotten any help from them either. So that was kind of frustrating because, because I kind of figured that at least one of them would have, would have said, Oh yeah, no problem. You know what you need, but uh, you know, I'm sure he'll get his help somewhere. If we don't uh, get him in touch with Dennis or Chris or something, we'll, we'll get I him. Assume he's gonna, I assume he's going to, you're going to direct him to watch this recording. Oh yeah, to get, his, to get his answers right. Oh for sure, yeah, he'll he'll definitely you know, be watching. And, and if and if, he, if this person is watching, I can say one thing: whether it's one to one racing or slot racing, don't give up. Don't give up, yeah. yeah, yeah, don't, and don't let anyone dissuade you if this is something that you want to do. Yeah, Just don't buy a better car, right? Don't. That's yeah. all. Just gonna buy a better car and a better controller. And, don't forget that. Yeah, and the more enthusiastic the person is about about what he's doing, the easier it is for those guys that are giving him advice, right? Yeah. If you find somebody who's prepared to try things and who's, you know, he's getting into it, he's trying this, he's trying that, he's running around, you know, he's, he's uh, those guys, you, uh, you know, as, a, as someone trying to help them, you feel like your time is much better spent yeah. than some guy who's just, you know, oh, I did what you said, it didn't work, you know, I'm going to go talk to somebody else. Hey, please go yeah, and, and if else. you do have things that don't work, I mean, I have bent front wings and I wear them as a badge of honor. <laughs> just, just to throw a little spanner in the works there, uh, sometimes it's not the car, sometimes it's your approach to the driving. You may have to change how you brake or how you accelerate, things like that. That can make a big difference. Yeah, especially when you start changing the car. If you're yeah, if you've got yourself used to driving one kind of car, and you make a big change, you're gonna have to get yourself used to driving that kind of car too. Exactly. Yeah, I think we've beaten this one down. <laughs> I did have one other topic that that should probably generate a, a, a good amount of discussion. But did anybody else have any last minute that they want to toss in on this topic or uh, some other thing that they want to bring up? I I asked early on before we had quite so many guests on. You know, did anybody have any show and tell or anything they wanted to do? Russ, did you have a show and tell? I have a comment on that. Okay, go one, ahead. One of the things that discouraged me a little bit in the beginning, being in a club, was, you know, being a newbie, you want to try to kind of fit in. And you want to do the things you need to do. So you may wind up marshalling if you do um even in a crash and burn situation you still marshal because you got to take the cars off and all that but i tell you what and you and i both know the person i'm not going to say their name but you know a lot of people just go ballistic if they don't like the way you're marshalling they start screaming at you when you're trying to put the car back on, which makes things worse. And um, I just think, you know, a little patient with the newbies. You know, being, being a little more patient. Well, you, you can always look at them in the face, Russ, and say, I didn't make your car come off the truck. <laughs> what do you got, Scott? If they hadn't crashed, it wouldn't be an issue. Right. They, they crashed. They're frustrated with themselves more than they're frustrated with you. Right. You know, it's the same thing in RC. It's the same thing with whatever. But I guarantee you in RC, they start gassing it while I'm trying to marshal them. <laughs> go ahead. You know, you just go ahead and beat yourself to death in that corner. I'm good with it. 
you know, it was it was when when I was going to yell and scream. Somebody in the club needs to take them aside for a moment and just have a, a heart to heart and say, listen, man, that's just that's not acceptable. It's not cool. You know, you, you, and you don't have to be vicious about it or anything else. Just, you know, it's a, it's it's time for a, a, a learning session. Yep. <laughs> what was that, Chris? I just popped in for a minute, guys. I'm between students, so I got to go. <laughs> okay. Have a good one. Thanks okay. for joining us, Scott. You know, that's, you know, Russ, that's, that's sort of a, that's an inexperienced driver. Um, a lot of times in big races uh, or club races, I'll look at the various marshals on various corners and I'll know who's a good marshal and who's not a good marshal. And I will say to myself, I am not coming off at that corner. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that eliminates any, you know, hostilities between me and the marshal, which there should never be. Because the marshal, you know, if, if you're sitting there with your finger flicking cars off the track as they come by, like I, I'd be a little annoyed with you as well. But if, if the driver drives it off the track, well, that's, hey, too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and apparently, and I think I know there's at least a couple of people that, I, that, that Russ might be talking about. Uh, they're, they're what most people would consider uh, experienced drivers. Uh, yeah. So apparently, some people just don't get the right experience. <laughs> they still come off, and but they still get all pissed off if their marshalling isn't perfect. Yeah. But yeah, they, fine, but there know. are some guys who have twenty years experience, and others who have twenty times one years experience. Yeah, twenty times one year. <laughs> no, you're right, Greg, because if you think about it, oh, no, I'm not going to put you in that position, but. <laughs> I've been around the club and that club and racing on and off. And I have seen people come and go. And a lot of the people go kind of because of the same reason. Yeah. So just for what it's worth, you know, I, I try to be nice to everyone, you know, and I try to help if I can um, when I've got, Youngins over <laughs> playing on the track. I'll turn the voltage down and make it fun for them because they want to come back. Can we race on the track? Can we race on the track? You know, and it's it's neat to see them light up like that because I know that's what I did. You know, when I was six, and it uh, it's a lot of fun. So that's my two cents. Well, right. well, well, that that spirit, I, I can, I can, I can say with a, a lot of affirmation, that spirit is still in us all. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, our faces still light up like six-year-olds. <laughs> all right, I'm going to move us on to the other topic that I had, and that was, if, presumably, if money and space were not an issue, and you could do any track, is there a real-life racetrack that you would? like to make into a slot car track and i see lots of nodding so i'm gonna go ahead and start with no uh but that's me because i did not grow up watching road racing uh if there were a track i would mimic it would be this one right around the corner it used to be called seattle international seattle international raceway pacific raceways now uh it's a it's a cool little track uh and you know you can get a google image view of it and and plot it out and, and, and design a track based on it. But in general, what I've found uh, mostly by vicariously, but also by trying it out a couple of times, slot car tracks that are that are made to represent a real track generally aren't very good slot car tracks. What you want to do is take inspiration from the real track and include features that, that you like from the real track, like the corkscrew uh, and, and, you know, Mulsanne and whatnot, you know, nice long straight and, and you want to take features from your favorite track rather than try to make an actual proportional copy of that track. That's me. Who else would like to go? I saw Russ and Dennis both nodding and John just held up his hand. I, I myself would like um, Riverside Raceway. Just mm. what I grew up around. And I, 
thought it looked fun, you know, and I think it'd be kind of neat. Um, I do think that a couple of long straights would be great. I think the ultimate track would be about 145 feet, linear feet. So there you go. So Riverside, anybody else got a Riverside? No, I, I, I was going to say to, to Russell, Russell point, uh, the great thing about Riverside too is that it had, it had different configurations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis, yeah, I've, I've, I've driven on a, I've driven on a, a one or two uh, recreations of Riverside as slot car tracks, and it works very well. It's a, it's a very nice uh, track mm -hmm. for, for a change into that, and primarily because of the all of the S's leading up to turn six, mm -hmm. right? And then if you if you can model in the um, the elevation changes, then that Humpty bump going down from turn six over the bumps and down into turn seven, that is absolutely so much fun on a slot car track if you get it right. It's really nice. Uh, very similar to the to to doing a corkscrew. Um, personally, if I was gonna if I had lots of space and I was gonna do it, I would do Fiorano, the the Ferrari test track. You know the one? I'll share. Yep. I'll, 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 can you enable my sharing? And I'll yep, hold on. put a photo here. Yep, yep. Go for it. Um, there we go. I, I have an image in my head, but it's probably not right. Yeah, that was not the image. <laughs> okay. So this is just this is just an image that I picked up, and it's not it's not absolutely complete because there's a piece missing up at the top there. But there's a couple of things. First of all. There's a couple of different variations. Second of all, I've always thought that it would be cool to have a little uh, circular test track or a skid pad inside it. Uh, and then the other thing is it actually has a flyover, so um, you equalize the lanes. So as a slot car track, it, it might be a lot of fun. Yeah. So that, that would be one that I would try, either that or Suzuka. But a lot of guys have done Suzuka, so this one, this one would probably be the one that I would try to do. Suzuka works well. I mean, I've driven on a couple of Suzukas. Yep, and that, too. They as work well. As far as a slot car track of a real track, it works well. Yeah, they do. I have seen the Fiorino test track uh, in slot car form. Uh, the the BLST, the guy who does the routed digital uh -huh. slot car tracks, he did a Fiorino that oh, I then okay. modeled, a, uh, yeah. modeled a plastic track out of it. I haven't driven on it, but yeah, that does look nice and slot trackable. There's a group of guys up in, I think they're in New Jersey the, uh, or, or somewhere on the, uh, to the east of all of us um, called Barn Burners. You see them on, uh, on Home Racing World every now and then. It's a club there and they have a, they have a nice uh, Silverstone um, layout that they use and they have a nice spa layout that they use uh, with lots of scenery and you know, making it look really like the original. And uh, it seems like they, they have a lot of fun on those. But they're not exactly proportionally accurate, are they? They're, oh, they're... maybe not, but they're interpretations of them. Yeah. yeah Enough like that you could, look at the, you could look at the track and say, oh, that was that spa or that Silverstone. Yeah. Yeah. Catalonia. Suzuka. I've seen lots of Catalonias. Catalonia is my favorite one. Yeah. Luff, I saw you raise your hand earlier. Do you have a, a dream track? Oh, no. Uh, I think you should just pick certain corners and, and try and incorporate those. And even if they're all from different trucks, just pick corners that you like or that'd be interesting to drive. Um, I think for a home truck, 90 to 100 feet is about the maximum. And lately, I've liked three lane trucks. We've built five and six lane tracks, but the three lane seems to be the best. Yeah. I know a, a few years ago, the, the BBC and Martin Brundle did a scale electrics track on, you know, the top 20 corners that they came up with. Mm. And I think it was the most hideous looking thing you could have ever. Like, some cool individual corners, but but trying to force all these things together just didn't didn't really work out well at all. Design uh, committee. <laughs> yeah, now, uh, David Beatty at um, Slot Mods, he does that a lot on some of those super yeah. fancy tracks that he builds. 
that he, he'll yeah, try he to incorporate. His, yeah, he built Road America, that which is the one I would do. Slot Mods made Road America for one of the racers. Um, Bobby Rahal. Bobby, Bobby Rahal, I think. Rahal, yeah. And that fell together pretty nice. That's a nice track to build. Mm -hmm. You need a lot of room, though. I mean, we could spend an entire episode on just looking at slot mods tracks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's look at that one. Uh, actually, <laughs> oh, here's a question. Has anyone ever driven a slot mods track? No. Yeah. yeah. I have. How are they? They're fine. There was one in, um, um, there was one in the Toronto Auto Show a couple of years ago that uh, they commissioned. I think it was for Audi. Yeah, uh, yeah. The one they tour around in a truck. Yeah, yeah. The glass yeah. paneled side. Yeah. Thing, right? yeah. 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 There's the there's the one in the in the um, LeMay Auto Museum in Tacoma, yeah. and it looks fantastic. I, I imagine that uh, if you were racing on it, it would be you know like racing on any other really nice routed slot car track that they didn't let people go any faster than the car would stay on at you know full throttle so it wasn't really racing greg so what was the, <laughs> what was the track you liked greg it's by you oh uh, pacific raceways that was the it first track to... i ever ever drove on it's still but it's got a new name right yeah it used to be called seattle international seattle international raceway you know i lived in auburn for a while right by it and oh, nice. that was well, the first place the first place i ever raced i'll be darned cool got yeah. it well, I'm driven that truck. It's a nice track. This was back in the seventies. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to to get my car on it, but you got to pay pay big pay big money to take their their driver's course, and then you know huh. you standards and stuff like that. You can't just go drive your car on their track. Do they get any good races now? Big races at all? Oh, they're they're still doing races. They do lots of drag races, lots of motorcycle racing, lots of um, retro racing, and yeah, they're 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 pretty active. Do they drag race on the main straight still? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm close enough. I'm 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 basically on the opposite hill with the casino, and so oh. when they're drag racing, it's just like every every few minutes you hear a in the background. Oh, I haven't I've seen. Been, that. I've I been seventy two. <laughs> well, just, just, just remember, Greg, the cheapest way to improve the the performance of your car is to go to driving school. Of course. Sabotage <laughs> the other guy. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Graham? I heard you I heard you pipe in. No, I've I've drag raced on SIR a few times back in the eighties. And I've been around the course, not driven it, but I've been around the course on Porsche Club days as a passenger, you know, and stuff. And it, it is a nice course and it's it's been there a long time, just outside of Kent, Washington, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Looks like it's got a lot of nice um elevation changes too. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, the double hairpin going yeah. down downhill, yeah. and then you got a nice kind of S going back up the other side yeah. of it. Well, Westwood okay. out here in Westwood and Port Coquitlam out this way by Vancouver, it's a lot of elevation changes and stuff. So I've I've driven that course too. So yeah. hmm. I guess for me, if the, if the question was if money and size was not a a consideration, why would you settle for one? I mean, for me, that's that's part of the reason I, I haven't gone to a, a, a wood routed track. Other part of it is I probably don't have enough time to devote to the hobby to truly get the cars to run well. Mag racing, I can get good performance with, you know, basics, you know, lubrication, truing tires and wheels. Uh, I usually try to lessen the magnet effects a little bit with shims or things of that nature. But I run scale electric sport. I probably got, oh, if I had to get, I got a four, uh, eight by 16 table down there, probably running about 65 feet, but I probably change my track four times a year. Huh. And to me, that's part of the appeal of the sport track. And, and don't get me wrong, as a kid, I, I raced wood tracks. I've run on them. My dad worked for MPC and AMT. And I mean, so I grew up around this, this hobby business. And, uh, but to me, I love the idea. And sometimes that it may take me days to get a layout I like. Uh, I get a lot of inspiration from you guys, the layouts I see on the forums. I'll try something and maybe there's just one turn that just doesn't work, you know? And again, I'm racing with 13 year olds. I got an eight year old granddaughter that comes over. And, and sometimes, you know, you need to maybe stretch that curve out a little bit and not make it quite so technical. 
But uh, to me, the idea of, of a, one track in my basement doesn't appeal to me. I, I love the idea that I can change this. You know, I've been toying right now with maybe doing an oval around the outside and just tighten up the road course inside, literally two tracks. Um, I'm kind of dipping my toes into the, uh, the digital thing. I, I picked up an ARC-1 base from Professor Motor. Now, his is modified where all it does is count the laps. It uses the apps. It doesn't use the controllers. I have controllers. I'm a Professor Motor controllers. My track's hardwired. Um, I kind of leaning toward the ARC Pro. I, I've, I've got about 50 cars, and the thought of having to chip those is terrifying. Um, and I like the analog and I, I primarily race by myself. So the digital, there's not necessarily a, a real benefit there, but yeah. wow. One, one track, I, I, I think I would go mad, but uh, <laughs> th that could be me. Um, I, I like the idea of being able to change it. I've lately, the bug's been up my butt to do uh, a Le Mans. I, I've seen, the, and there's several of them out there, you know, the old, whatever was it, Slossets. He had all the track layouts on his website. Uh, there's several Le Mans versions. I always thought Laguna Seca could be fun um, and some of the others, but one, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Well, 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 Brian, to your point, what you do in plastic, Luff does in wood. Like, you'll just take a yes. look and go, yeah, I'll just do a new track. I was just yeah. going to say. <laughs> yes, three days later, you're racing on a new track. Exactly. Yeah. But, but I, see, I, have, I have CNC equipment here. I, I, I do custom guitar work for, for luthiers. I build bodies. So Ooh. my thought was actually, and I, I think people have toyed with this idea, was a modular wood track. Can, can, you, um, can you build me a base? <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, see, I don't do whole guitars typically. I just do the bodies. Okay. Um, and then the luthiers typically finish those. And I'm, I've shipped them all we'll, over the we'll, world. We'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> something in, uh, you know, think scale electrics in wood. You know, it would yeah. probably have to be copper taped to be practical. Um, I don't have an issue with that. Oh, so, so you're talking about like a modular wooden track? Sure, why not? I mean, I think, wooden track. I think not just modular. Yeah, there, are, there are systems out there like that. I mean, yeah. Slotfire from Germany does that. And yeah. There are a couple of others, I think. Now, again, a... you're going to be stuck with standard radius turns. Now, myself, having the CNC, I could, I could make whatever radius I wanted to a degree. I can, I, my machine will hold a two foot by three foot piece of wood. Now, straight away, I can go as long as I want because I just got to keep sliding it along and let it cut the grooves. Um, turns, you know, it would take some planning to do. But I mean, has anybody ever raced on anything like that or seen anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's been around. It's not as, it's not that common. You know, most, most tracks are, are relatively permanent. Uh, as far as changing the track, uh, obviously, I, you know, when I first got into it, you know, me and the boys would be doing new layouts all the time on the living room floor, even when I had my table up, the layout changed a few times. I think the main reason that I'm capable of having the same layout for such a long period is because for the last 10 years, I've been racing with multiple clubs with multiple layouts. And so every, every time I go racing, it's a different layout. I mean, sure, it's, you know, let's say 20 different tracks over the, you know, over the, all the, the two clubs and all the, all the tracks, it's 20 different layouts. But that's enough variety. I don't feel the need to to, to change mine because I know, you know, I yeah, I got a good home track advantage here, but not at the other track. <laughs> I guess the other thing is too that if you have, if you have, uh, one track, or let's say you have you have four tracks and fifty cars, uh, the other way to do it would be to have one track and two hundred cars, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You laugh. <laughs> <laughs> You know I what, said, Dennis? I'm sorry. I'm stealing that from my wife. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Does what, anybody yeah. else have any dream tracks they want to? They love that to. That's not that far fetched, though, because some of these cars just aren't suited for certain tracks. For example, you know, you look at um, who's the guy in H HRW who does all the uh, the modifieds, um, old timer, um, Strange Brew. You know, his cars probably wouldn't be a whole lot of fun on my 65 foot road course, but on an oval, they'd be a blast, I'm sure. Yeah, well, cross for tracks. To point. some degree, you know, the, the car has to fit the track in certain cases. Other cases, you know, a Trans Am Camaro or, or, or a Mustang, you can run that just about on anything. 
All right. Does anybody else have any dream tracks they'd like to make in slot car form? Hearing none. Anybody else have any okay. topics? Yeah, I'll right here. chime in to the tracks. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of um, favorite tracks and things like, you know, Suzuka, Silverstone, Catalonia, Spa, a lot of those sorts of things and that. But one track, what I would absolutely love to replicate is Mount Panorama Bathurst. Ah. Especially if I can get some of the elevation in there as well, up at the top of the hill and that where you come over the top of Skyline and, then and you just completely dip down into the S's. And then you've got the long back straight as well, where you can get some decent speed and that before going into the chase and breaking hard. That is a fantastic track. Yeah, I'm, lovely I'm, for slot I'm, cars. Yeah, I'm surprised nobody's mentioned Brands Hatch. Elevation change. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you, need, you need a ladder to, if you would made it to scale to climb up to see the top of the hill. <laughs> it'd be like it'd be like one of the left tracks. It's four, yeah. four, four feet or five feet of oh, elevation change. Yeah. <laughs> the map panorama would be fun. That sounds like a good one. Yeah, or, or John was just saying back first, and nobody mentioned that. Oh, same track. Yeah. No, okay. I, I said uh, Brands Hatch. Sorry, Brands Hatch. Sorry, Bathurst is Mount Panorama. Brands Hatch is the one that you said. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Brands Hatch. <laughs> I think Brands, Brands Hatch is like the old Kyalami circuit in South Africa. They're just a little too simple. Yeah. To me, mm, pretty just, simple. You know, not enough turns somehow. Okay. So you're boring, John. <laughs> hey, uh, hi guys. Uh, Ray here. Uh, and it's actually, um, I had started thinking about modeling the new Kyalami thicket, uh, which is a little more interesting. But uh, when I first started, I was thinking about Kyalami. Yeah. And then I drove uh, Barbara Motorsports Park in my 1 1 car. And I really enjoyed oh, that. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, that might be a good one. Yeah, the the new Kyalami circuit had uh, again a lot of that. A lot of the new circuit is uh, is uh, kind of um, the the interest in it is those massive elevation changes going up the hill and then down the mine shaft. Yeah, um, but it's, yeah, it's it's quite an it's a much more interesting circuit because it has a lot more turns than the original one did. The original track was a was just a, was a very very fast track yeah and uh so what i ended up with for my uh, garage track was a uh what i call uh <coughs> well you guys talked about the idea of taking turns from your favorite track and elements of your favorite tracks and i call my track uh talaseka spa bergering <laughs> nascar track a banked nascar four turn oval around the outside and the infield has a corkscrew from uh, from uh, Laguna Seca. It has the uh, carousel of the Nurburgring, and it has it had Urouge from Spa, <clears throat> but I've kind of revised that. But uh, that's what I did. I, it's an 18 by 8 track, and I just took the my favorite elements of each, and it isn't what I call a flow track because you're doing very different things at different parts of the lap. Um, you, when you run the outside, when you run the uh, NASCAR oval, that's uh, counterclockwise. And uh, when you run it clockwise, the cars automatically go into the infield and do all of those other turns I talked about. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> that is cool. I wouldn't, wouldn't mind seeing pictures of that at some point. Yeah, I, um, I, I was trying to get some stuff online to show pictures last week because I didn't have the uh, bandwidth to do a walk around, but uh, I was having trouble getting the pictures from uh, my phone to the uh, computer. So I'll get that done hopefully by next week. Or if you, po or if you post them on a thread in, in HRW yeah. or SCI or something like that, we can we can pull it up and show it, show it off. Sure one, one of the big issues that, that we have in slot car racing is you know, nothing's real. I mean, you got the cars are so bloody fast and everybody's working on, you know, four by eight tables. You know, if, if you figure out, I mean, your average slot, your average one to one skate track is say two and a half miles long, right? That's 410 feet in one 30 second skate. So 
you, you know, any of any of the tight twisty things that we see, you know, in scale actually have 30 feet straight in between them. <laughs> so, which makes it, which makes it great for a slot car track. But when you try and do, um, you know, our, our copies of Catalonia with, you know, three sections of, of um, sport track as your main straight and just the rest all wiggly, it, it, it really puts things, you know, you got to redesign the, the whole track. I, I never build a table. <laughs> yeah. No such thing as tables in Love's house. No. <laughs> and I try to avoid straightaways. Yeah. It yeah. just doesn't take any skill to drive a straight. Yeah. Yeah, but you got to get the car going. You, wants yeah, to... you can have like a general S or, or a big long sweeper, but it's just. Yeah, if you, you, know, if you, look, you, at get... the, if you look at some of the tracks that are being built for the world, for world championships and things these days, the flat tracks for 124 scale, uh, the ISRA, the International Slot Racing Association. A lot of those don't have straightaways on them anymore either. Even even the even the section in front of the driver's panel is now a gentle sweeper, a very very long gentle sweeper uh, for two reasons. One, because you know it takes no skill to drive a straight, as Love says. Two, because it gives much better sight lines for the people that are standing there, um, because you you bend the straightaway, and so oh, everybody oh. can see what's going on, which is a really nice idea. But most of those, just if they do have a straightaway, there's one, and all the rest are what they call banana straights. Right? Yeah. They're all uh, at some or other angle, or some or other radius, or some or other sweep or compound radius. Yeah. I, I always try to put the driver stations where you don't have to turn your head all the time. Yeah, and sometimes the main straight is the is the worst place to put it because you're going like this. <laughs> yeah, but if you can drive from one end you don't it, you can just sit down and relax yeah <laughs> not get a sore neck i'm getting I, old i was at the new uh, commercial raceway that opened here in southern california this weekend and they have one of those king tracks right and there was a guy out there uh, running one of his wing cars and i stood just next to him and tried to follow the car around i can't move my head fast enough anymore Mm -hmm. All right, because my neck is a little stiff anyway. And I just could I I mean the guy was doing 1.9 second laps, right? <laughs> on a on a track that it's 155 linear feet, so it's probably on a on a footprint of of 30 by 15 or whatever. But um I couldn't follow the car. I just mm -hmm. did not have enough movement and enough speed. <laughs> in, but you can muscles. hear the thing fluttering. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. There's videos out there of guys standing at the, you know, with the wing cars and stuff and guys standing at the thing and they put the videos to music of, you know, <laughs> of going on, right? It's, it's, uh, it's quite something to watch. You know? Yeah, that's a, that's a good video. It's like uh, classical music and uh, all the guys yeah. are doing their motions and stuff. Yeah, that's a good video. Yeah, I think it's from Finland or something like that, where they run those big tracks and the, the big wing cars with the sides on them and stuff, right? So what, what, are, what do they call it? Slot Lake? Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I don't know what they call it. No, it, was like, it was like something in the key of something, something like that. <laughs> okay. Well, as long I, as like, I, I mean, hey, why not show up with a tutu? I mean, that'd be cool. I, I like to videotape actual guys driving like go from one driver to the next and just videotape their faces and how they held their controller and some guys are jerky some guys are smooth it's just more interesting than watching cars watching separate. The cars yeah and it's, it's it's funny the um one of the guys who's uh quite successful these days in wing car racing is a toronto boy named brad friesner and brad set the world the, the you know, um, Dennis was talking about 1.9 seconds, which is, is not a very good wing car racer. That's real slow. Um, Brad set the world record at 1.2. So <laughs> Brad laps this guy every one and a half laps. Anyways, when, when Brad set the world record, 
for qualifying, he did not look at his car. <laughs> yeah, he, he, even the driver can't move their head that fast. No, it, it's and um, and over one lap, you're you're, it's so dialed in with glue and all the rest of this stuff. You don't even, you just push the trigger and wait and see what happens at the end of the lap. <laughs> they don't even have to slow down. Well, the crazy know. part about that is that they get a minute to qualify. Yeah. They probably only do like three laps in that minute. Brad, Brad did one lap when he when he broke the world record. Put the car on the track, one lap, 1 1.236 or whatever the hell it was a couple of years ago, took yep. the car off the track. Yeah. And then he had to rewind the motor. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. That, <laughs> no, well, he can't. Yeah. None of these guys rewind. They're, they, you, they're all very... Uh, Another guy, another Toronto boy, is one of the best uh, armature builders in the world, too. Dan Miller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's been making motors for a long time. Yeah, well, he um, is an interesting side. When I was about four, when I was 15, uh, he was Dan Camilleri back then. I don't know if you know that. I know. And um, Dan took me under, I was a, a PK factory racer when I was 15. And Dan, PK stands for Potential Kinetics, too. That's his company. Yeah. So and, the guys uh, he, was, he was building all my armatures and all my motors for me when I was one back then. But. I have a bunch of his stuff that are very, very good. Yeah. So if you want to go fast slot car racing, you need to be in Toronto. <laughs> I mean, it's that's just it's yeah, crazy. I, I mean, it's just I don't nuts. understand it. Yeah. No, yeah. well, I mean, there's, there's there's a bunch of things. The first thing is that qualifying is its own its own technology. It's not qualifying of wing cars anyway, and certainly in the open class, uh, it's it's a technology unto itself, separate from racing, yeah. because they use different motors, they use different power. Because they, they run, they do, they run their qualifying on sixteen volts, where they run all their all their racing on less than that, usually fourteen point four, um, and you know, so the guys will set their cars up. You've got to run the same car in the race, the same chassis and body, but you can't run the. You can't, hold, oh, sorry, I've got somebody at my door. Hold on a moment. I'll come, I'll come back to you. Okay. I'm sure Chris can address that. What the heck? <laughs> uh, well, it's 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 so high tech that yes, you use um, a lighter gear. You'll use a slightly different armature. It, it you only got to do two laps. So if your motor blows up for a hundred dollar rebuild, like who cares? Like so, you you stress everything to the max. Um, Why I don't. <laughs> What's the point of qualifying if you're not racing that car? Well, no, but the, this, the, you, well, you're racing that car, but you can change the, it's, it's, it's all about the, you know, the prestige of setting the world record at the world. So well, sure. You're... I mean, yeah, that I get, but I just don't get, I mean, I, and I understand, you know, being able to change the motor for whatever is the regulation motor. I just don't understand that the qualify is at a different voltage level with different spec well, basically. You know, rules are yeah i mean that's just yeah. does it make a lot of sense no it doesn't thank you it, it, it is what it is you know the whole wing car racing thing and and when dennis is back wing car racing is not fun it's like it's frenetic Sleep it. and you can't you know you can't have you know, buddies over and wing car race. Like, it's impossible. Um, well, I, I guess, Chris, you can if you don't want the mower for very long. Well, yeah, I mean, even even a race motor, I mean, after, you know, two or three heats, um, it's basically toast. Um, you got to take it all apart and rebuild it for a second. You got to have the, the com cut and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's a 60 or $70 rebuild after eight or nine minutes of running for the motor. You know, it's, it's, uh, and, and it's, it's testing, testing. It's, it's just like F1, like thousands of a second mean, a, you know, on a, on a 1.2 second lap, a thousandth of a second is a mile. Like it's, it's a big thing. I'll be back in a couple of minutes, guys. Sure. Okay. Don't worry, Dennis. And, and, you know, it's not even just wing cars that, that 
get get to that kind of level, I guess. Oh, no, it's... racers get there too. You know, their their cars move so fast they, they can't watch their cars either. <laughs> well, we have the the new track there in East Building. Um, it's an ogle. It's about a hundred and fifty five foot uh, uh, wood track that's going to be spray glue and blah 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 blah. We'll probably we won't be racing wing cars because this is a wing cars race on big high bank tracks. So we'll be racing cars that are like Eurosport cars, which is sort of the equivalent of a wing car, but for a flat track. These things are blisteringly quick. Um, you know, and there'll be lots of guys that come in and, and just go, you know, no, because we're going to go, okay, it's, you know, to get a half decent motor for this is going to be a couple hundred bucks and you're going to rebuild it constantly and you're going to go through tires and, and then they go downstairs to the plastic track where we can sell them a scale electrics car and they can take it out and go around and around and around and around and around all day Saturday and nothing happens. And then they come back Sunday and go around and around and around. So, um, and it's not that fun. You can't nerf, you can't bump guys off, you can't see your cars. Um, it's all about technology. So, so that's definitely a track where I can't take my classic Cox Cheetah and think I can do a couple of laps. You can take your classic Cox Cheetah and run it on the plastic track downstairs. It'll run fine. Right. But your classic Cox Cheetah has either rubber and or urethane tires that you've made for it. And they will not work well on spray glue. The car much too much bite, and the car will just tip over in the corners. Chris, I, you, I gotta you add can run it. You can you can pedal it around, but it, the track with glue on it is not suited for for those kind of tires. Chris, I gotta ask from a from a commercial aspect because I'm assuming this is a commercial track. Yep. Is that really is that really viable? I mean, is there that much interest in it that? to justify the expense of something that large, that attractive? Uh, the, the commercial slot car tracks have never been viable since the early 60s. Um, this is, it is a commercial slot car track. It, there are, I can't get into the financial details of who's backing it and how the whole thing's working and how much rent was, but this is more of a club, track that's going to sell parts and it's um the guy who's owned the track has had six or seven none of them have done this is going to be open because not as a money maker it's it's a, a thing to do yeah but um anyone listening who is thinking of opening a commercial slot car track should think again yeah it's a hideous idea it's it's a uh, you know make a small fortune in slot cars don't you well yeah absolutely <laughs> start with a large one well it's <laughs> you know i mean the basic business premise is you, you know you, i mean you've, you've got a track you've, you've got a three thousand square foot store or whatever the hell you've got and you've got a track and you think well you, you know and i've talked to lots of guys who have opened tracks over time and they said oh no i'm gonna have to have you know, high school students in here because, you know, it's going to be so busy, it's going to be nuts. And I'm going, well, hang on. Who, who's going to come in here Tuesday at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? Like, everybody's working and kids are in school. Like, the, no one's coming in here. So sure enough, you know, and if you're renting, you know, $1.25 or $1.50 or whatever the hell is for 15 or 20 minutes, Christ, how, how like, how much, how much do you have to rent to, to pay a, you know, four or $5,000 monthly rent bill for God's sake? I mean, it's a hideous idea. Yeah, it's basically the uh, retirement savings being spent on. on well, there were, there were at one stage at the heyday, there were more commercial slot car tracks in the United States than there were bowling alleys. Yeah. That's... And they were all sold as a turnkey operation from AMF, and Ravel Raceways and a big few corporations who put together a big marketing program when the fad began. And we sell you a track and parts and it's a turnkey operation and away you go. And everybody thought, boy, oh boy, isn't this great? 
and 99.9% .9 of them folded up real fast. Yeah, yeah, because again, you're right. You, you do the math, but you know, for square footage for dollar earned and you it doesn't work. There's no, you know, yeah. when I, when I work, can support that. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I helped out uh, with Ernie's last track after I retired, I'd go in and, and uh, build customer cars or things for the red, like we'd have a bunch of guys who would, we had a bunch of services, like I would true tires and set up cars and, and do stuff like that. So I'd go in on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, I'd retire and I got nothing better to do. And there was many Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Mondays that no one came in the store. Um, well, they, they, I mean, it's Tuesday afternoon, you're, you're working, kids are at school, who the hell's coming in, you know? Yep. And then, you know, and, and then, you know, a, a few folks thought, well, we'll hold birthday parties. So you have a birthday party and, yep. and you got to be competitive price wise. So tracks would say, okay, well, it's 250 bucks for a couple of hours plus the half an hour before and the half an hour cleanup. So I, I, I refused to be there on birthday parties after the, I just drove me, kids were on the track, you know, throwing popcorn and spilling like, so anyway, I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. I mean, you, you can't, it is what it is, but customers would phone up and they'd say, hi, Chris, it's Saturday. How many birthday parties are on? And I would say, well, this, there's one at one and one at four. And they would say, see you next weekend. So you have one birthday party or two birthday parties and you have closed your whole store down for 500 bucks if it's two birthday parties. So that's the maximum revenue you can get on a Saturday, which is, doesn't work, doesn't work. Especially if you like to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't doesn't work you know the hobby will continue and continue and continue but it's it's all the guys on here who have home tracks or club tracks or this track or that track um you know don't plan to see a, a rebirth of uh, commercial racing i mean if we're honest with ourselves we have little toy cars that just follow a slot in a track and the big thing is if you go too fast they fly off <laughs> right and you compare that with kids video games today and you'd be insane to play with slot cars if you were a kid today yeah yeah i you know i i, I think about that quite often you know since the covid hit um my slot car track i probably run it maybe half dozen times but the three Xbox One X's that I bought, three of them since, since uh, April, and the three Th Thrustmaster TMX Pros that I bought, and the three racing stands that I bought, uh, and the 50-inch uh, displays that I have on, on all but one that has a 65-inch display. Sorry, uh, I got to go hit the road to get to Phil's house. Those... those uh, <laughs> Those are those are getting used a lot, you know. And and you know, I I look at slot car racing as a as a hobby. It's a great hobby. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm I'm not leaving slot car racing, but after resisting, uh, really, you know, I've I've owned a game console since forever. You know, I've had an original Xbox 360, then got an Xbox One. I probably had 20 hours on both those consoles. But since COVID hit, the ability to sit down and run a race on this console, and even if my, my nephews, my great nephews, my buddies who all have, oh, by the way, I've given away two of these setups. So literally, uh, I've given away uh, an Xbox, an Xbox One X, two Thrustmasters. I mean, I've, I've, I've seated people to get them to race with me because I was locked in the house alone but it's pretty neat to kind of do a proxy race where I jump online and the difference between slot car racing and video games is when kids touch the slot car itself, they're excited because they can hold the car. 
and they've been looking at their car as pixels. And when the power goes out, you can't touch the thing. You can't, you don't really own it. You own the game console, you own the game, but you don't own the car. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, you own it when the game's loaded up on the console or on your, your PC. But, you know, when you look at the, the difference, you know, in gaming, you know, you're basically looking at a bunch of winkety lights with a controller in your hand that buzzes and you go, ooh, ooh, this is good. With the slot car racing, you know, you have this thing that can go on display when you're not running it. You've got this racetrack that maybe you've built it yourself. You know, it's a plastic track. You didn't make the track pieces, but you built the track and you have, you can touch it. You can do things. So I think both hobbies work together, yeah. but what I found is, you know, now that things are loosening up just a little bit, my daughter's here, she's 17. Uh, a couple of her friends came over for a bonfire. They started playing on the, the game consoles. And one of the girls was getting motion sick. So the one of the other girls says, hey, let me take you downstairs and show you the racetrack. This, one of the girls had only been over there. This, this was her first time over. They came downstairs. They were just going to look at the track. I fired the thing up, and then they they started running a few laps. The next thing I know, I've got the software loaded up. They're, they're running laps. After about 15, 20 laps, they're like, okay, we're racing now. <laughs> and the new girl beat the girl who, who had been here and had spent many nights with my daughter, right? They're best friends. And so then she goes, Oh, start another race. I need at least 20 more laps because I got to beat Hannah before before we leave the basement. So she had to make sure she was competitive. But the funny thing was, you know, you look at the 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 difference in a game console and a slot car track, and some kids can't, you know, they they do get motion sick. You know, all the parallax scrolling and things that happen on a game console can make you motion sick. In the slot car track, they can watch that because it's a real item. So I think you can do both, but it is hard to imagine uh, any companies putting the kind of marketing in to make slot cars the big deal that they used to be. Nobody's. Uh, but but, but to, your point, to your point, Phil, you know, it, it's all getting the controller in the hands. Like I have guys over that are real one to one racers. And what we do is we have, you know, like a guy's night catered in. Uh, this was before our current environment. Yeah. Um, and I have racing sims that are networked and that's where the guys usually go. And then yeah. a couple of overflow guys go into the slot cart track with me. And all of a sudden I got guys in there till four in the morning. They won't leave like yeah. real racers. First oh, of all, yeah. they all started off with slot cars, yeah. but also there is a real world, um, issue when you go off the track like you can yeah, break there's something. A tactile and there's real consequences real consequences right you don't hit reset you you might have a wing that flies off or yeah. you know especially because everybody wants and, and that's the other thing you know you start off with sports cars and they go wait a minute are those formula one cars yeah oh i want those i want those yeah and everybody wants to go open wheel and once you got that it's like the hook is set and you're just reeling them in my yeah. my my biggest regret or sorry, my wife's biggest regret regret was that they were willing to buy some of my cars and I wouldn't sell them. <laughs> yeah. No, no disrespect, John, but all of these guys are old guys. No, no, uh, you know Tim Haraney on TSN. Yeah, but yeah. they're not, um, you know, sort of, you know, market size. Uh, Fly has announced they are relaunching their uh, two Ferrari 250 GTOs. They're going to do three liveries. They're going to do the Innes Ireland UDT Laystall livery and a couple of others. They are producing 150 of each because that's what they think they can sell. Sim racing this year, you have seen national TV networks sign up to do Sim IndyCar, Sim NASCAR, Sim Formula One. There's guys that are being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars as factory sim racers, or you can buy one of the 150 new Fly Ferrari GTOs that are coming in. So, I, I, yes, and, and, and 
don't get me wrong. I've been playing with slot cars since I, since 1961, and I will continue to play slot cars. No matter if the whole industry disappears, I've got more parts in my basement than, like, I'm the king. I own all the slot car parts, right? I'll be racing, and my, you know, kids and grandkids will be racing forever and ever and ever. But for the new generation, and, and you talk about consequences, there's a lot of kids today who do not want consequences. They want to hit the restart button. You know, when, when kids used to come into the track and they, they'd fall off the track and then they'd look up at me and go, well, what happens now? What about now? <laughs> now you put the controller down and then you walk to the end of the track there and put the car back on and then come back here. And they're going, no, no, that's, I'm not, you know, dad, where's my dad? Get my dad to do it. Get over So anyway. But at the same time, yeah. you, you, I mean, how many how many of us have seen a kid that doesn't have fun? I mean, it's rare. It, the, the majority of the kids who play on a slot car track are, are having a blast. But you're right. It's just for, for whatever reason, it's just for a not of time, the same power. Technology moves forward, guys. You know, I mean, that's that's what it is. You know, we could all we could all be on a party line right now trying to talk to each other. Or we could be on this pretty nifty, neat little box, tablet, phone, whatever you're sitting on. And, and uh, we're able to, if we choose, have a device that we can see and hear each other and share photographs and do everything else. So, you know, it clearly is, you know, the simulations are a great thing, you know, and, and uh, to have that tactile feedback, the force feedback stuff, you know, Kit, I'm looking at at uh, iRacing right now, because not only did I get all these Xboxes because they were easy, but I also had, you know, I bought, went and bought a new Surface Book with a with a nice GPU in it and things that I could I could use as a portable uh, sim racer. So when I'm on my boat, my boat's too small to have a full racing rig in it, but I can clamp a Thrustmaster onto the the uh, table below deck, and when it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> not now because it's Michigan. So this won't happen until next spring again now. But, you know, I, I do go below deck when it's raining and hook up a, a wheel and pedal set and drop my laptop on the, the table down below deck. And I'm sim racing in a, in a space well, that's six yeah, feet well, wide and eight feet long, you know. Well, to, to your point, Phil, that, that's exactly what I did because we started off with Grand Prix Legends who were 1967 yeah. and guys want to drive a Lotus 49s, right? So, okay, you want to really race a, like a, another Lotus 49 at 132nd scale? And I was like, well, what do you mean? First of all, th they thought it was a die cast. Yeah, yeah. And then you can actually, wait, you can actually race this thing? And it actually go, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Cool. The, the guys who like die casts and stuff. But hey, before we go, everybody earlier, I, I hate to bring this back up, Greg, but you said, hey, has anyone got a show and tell or anything like that? And I have a show and ask. Okay. I, I was at my fiance's mom's and we found this. Right? So oh, yeah. found this guy. Uh, it was upstairs in the attic and uh, I looked at it and I thought, man, that looks pretty cool, but I don't know who the maker is. I really don't know much about it other than I found this slot car and uh, it's pretty decent. I mean, in terms of the condition it's in, I've set it on my track and it'll run. I'm pretty sure it's a hundred and a one twenty four scale car because it's way bigger than anything. Yeah, it looks like it looks like a Cooper. Yeah, but but the cool thing is, it, if I had a second one on my scale electric sport track, it would side by side, so I could conceivably have it up and and going. I just need to to be able to do so. So I was wondering, does anyone recognize this beast? Yes. Tron Becker, right, Chris? Is that what it is? I think it's a Strombecker, yeah. Did, does Strombecker make a, a, a Cooper like that? Uh, what else would it be in 124? <laughs> Well, if, if you look at if you look at the bottom, Dennis, it looks like it's got a Can B Bobcat 16D motor in it with a yellow can. Oh, okay. Can we see the underneath again, Phil? Yeah, it has indeed. So, what does that mean inside it? 
Well, it looks to me, if you look at the body, bizarrely, it, it looks like I have um, an Atlas BRM that's uh, exactly the same molding. But I think after Atlas, when Marusan came along and started putting together a bunch of kit cobbled cars, I think it's I think it's a Marusan. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, you may be right because it it's not it's not Strombecker. Looking at it more closely, it's not Strombecker. The yellow can gave it away. Well, not only that, but the, it's a, the, the guide is wrong for Strombecker. Yep. yep. If it was a Strombecker that was clamshell like that, it would have had a different it would have had a different guide altogether. Well, uh, hang on, I'm going to. Uh... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Turn, yeah. Turning off the virtual background will help us. Your, see your virtual sure. background is giving us all kinds of trouble. Background so. that. Man. You got to click the arrow next to your your video. And then... <laughs> Choose virtual background and then this is choose none. Somewhat surreal right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Like, choose it's like you're coming through the teleporter on Star Trek. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You're being beamed down little bit by little bit. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, we've got a we've got a nice there's, visual for Halloween. Yeah. I'm at gym with a slot car. <laughs> Put your other hand behind the car. Or hold yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good you. idea. That's better. Still not still quite right, but better. <laughs> no, the deal is new. <laughs> no, on my on my display, there's nothing here that says. No, because you don't see your virtual background, right? No. I'm in the virtual background settings. We don't see a car at all. In, in wow. virtual background, but it's wheel. white, so it's white, so it disappears. In your or virtual backgrounds, can... you got to click on the one that says none. There is no one that says Scroll none. Up. Oh, there we go. Ah, Thank now we can you. see it. Yeah, because now we can see your, your room behind you. So I want to I want to show you a car here. Hang on. I think it's I think he's right. Is that a brass gear at the back? The it gear looks it's like it, it looks like it's uh pop metal. Yeah, the brass gear in the back of this thing. Oh, it is brass? Uh, then it's yeah. Marison. The chances are good that it's Marison. Yeah, that's what I think. Nice, Chris. Good good spot, buddy. That looks like a nice car, um, Phil. Yeah, well, you know, the tires. A little bit of there's some aged. some urethane tires on the rear, and yeah. uh, and you'd be you'd be in business, man. Yeah, yeah. So Get I'm gonna mess around and go online and see if I can find something similar or you know just like it. Yeah, yeah. look for you look for Atlas or Marusan, M A R U S A N. How about this, guys? There, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's that is the Atlas Cooper. Yeah. That's and they also did the BRM, and I think you've got the BRM. And that's the Atlas on the Atlas brass chassis, but that sort of was a giveaway for me. That's got that open frame uh, 206 motor in it. Well, we might have nice. to pick up on that topic next week. We are at we are past our two-hour mark, so I'm going to hit the stop button. You guys can keep chatting, and hopefully, we'll see everybody next time. Bye. Thanks.